morning. Well, first, I'd like to welcome everyone to our fourth installment of our interviews with the Old Testament prophets, day two. This morning, I'm pleased to introduce to you the prophet Isaiah. Welcome, Isaiah. I'm glad to be here. So my first question to you is, wow, why are you dressed like this? <laughs> well, I, I definitely grew up in a family of means. I went to the best schools. Um, I suppose today uh, you'd probably say that I was like grew up uh, inside the inner circle in Washington, D.C. I probably went to Harvard Law School. My family you know, would have made sure that I made uh, the contacts with all the movers and shakers. And I moved pretty seamlessly in and out of the king's court. So this is kind of standard issue, right? Mm. If you're going to be coming before the king. Went with the royal colors today. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to talk about myself because um, that's not really what I'm about. You're going to see that uh, very little was written about me, about my background. But I'll, I'll give you a few, few hints today. I was married. I was actually married to one of the only four prophetesses who were uh, presented in the Bible. We'll certainly get into um, my calling as a prophet. But I spent my career um, as one of the top advisors to the kings. I advised on spiritual matters. I advised on foreign policies. As I think you, know, you heard over the last day or so, Israel was in some dire straits. Mm. The glory days of David were long gone. Uh, we heard yesterday about how things kind of started to fall apart at the end of Solomon's reign. And then, of course, our terrible civil war split the kingdom. And I remained back in Judah, and I was ministering to the kings of Judah. So, uh, you know, I, I covered probably almost 60 years of administrations uh, for Judah, these are the, uh, the kings that I, I served in their court. King Uzziah, we're going to hear a little bit more about him. I'm sometimes called Azariah, but I also was there for Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. This is uh, me in the early days. Um, uh, this, is, this is me and Uzziah. You know, um, Uzziah, you know, he, he was a good king. He was really trying to hold it together. But although he personally tried to serve the Lord... He really did not follow through on what I had told him to do. We all wanted all the high places torn down. We wanted the idols wiped out from, from all of the, the countryside. And he just did not have the strength to go against the people and do this. And so the country continued to suffer. And here I, I covered uh, several other uh, reigns, you know, Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. We'll hear more about Hezekiah later. I won't tell you which one of these was them. Was them. <laughs> this is the situation. You know, here we are in Israel. Look what we're surrounded by. You know, during the glory days, we had all of God's protection. We had the glory of David and Solomon's kingdom. And now it just seems like we are just surrounded by turmoil by fighting, and basically we're under threat from all sides. And Israel, they are in, they are in deep trouble. Um, you can see these kingdoms arising from the north here, Assyria, um, they're going to get crushed. So I, I spend much of the early part of the book, about the first five chapters, basically warning our people here in Judah what's going to happen. And it's pretty obvious why they're in the situation that they are. It's because of sin. It's just not following in faithfulness and righteousness what God had called them to do. That, that was the situation. It was a really troubling time. And uh, I was trying my best to uh, get these kings to listen to God's counsel. Common theme, as yeah. we've heard for the last two days. Yeah. So Isaiah, what can you tell us about your family's situation and what happened to you at the end of your ministry? Ah, well, um, again, I didn't like to write about these things. Um, I was glad that God saw fit not to put a lot of attention on me uh, personally. But uh, I'll tell you, um, I was the son of Amos. Um, that's not to be confused with Amos, who was uh, another prophet. I'm not going to hear any more about Amos other than you know what I've told you already. I lived and ministered in Jerusalem for about uh, almost 60 years, from really before about 740 B.C., and then all the way up to about 686 B.C. And I saw a lot of kings, good and bad, rise and fall. 
I wrote a couple of biographies of those kings in, in uh, Second Chronicles, and so you, you can read them. Um, as I mentioned, I was married to a prophetess, and uh, we had two kids. And you know, when you're a prophet and your wife's a prophetess, you sort of got to, you're at, you're at God's service, right? And so uh, we had two sons, and we were instructed what their names were, sh- were to be. Pretty sure these are not going to make any of your top ten lists, okay? <laughs> Our one son was named Sheer Jashub. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What that means is a remnant shall return. And uh, this was a name that I think was given to convey the hope that Judah would survive the attacks from their enemies and a remnant uh, would be saved. And then, boy, our, our second son, he was, he was a mouthful. His name was uh, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. What this literally means is the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. And what this is really prophesying about in his name is what's about to happen to the northern kingdom. Assyria is going to come quickly, and they're going to be destroyed. End of my life. Well, it's not written about in Scripture. There are some oral traditions. You probably are familiar with a passage in Hebrews. This is from Hebrews 11, where the Hebrew writer is talking about many of the uh, saints of the Old Testament. Pick it up here in verse 36 in chapter 11. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. So the Hebrew writer is giving a list of some of the people that in oral traditions had basically been martyrs for the faith. So uh, the traditions that have been handed down over the centuries through the, through the, rabbinical, the rabbinical Talmuds um, is that evil King Manasseh, who wanted nothing to do with listening to God, he finally had enough of me, and he put me inside of a log, and he sawed me in two. So we share something in common here. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah, can you tell us about how you were specifically called by God to the prophetic ministry? <sighs> this, is, this is pretty emotional. Um, I'm just going to read you what I wrote. Okay. All right? Um, One thing you should know is, you know, being properly schooled, being on the inner circle of the kings, etc., I rubbed shoulders with all the priests. I knew very well about what went on in the priesthood, um, how they conducted, and how they approached the Holy of Holies. And... The day I was called, this was the vision that God gave me. I'll just read it. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, so I'm telling you exactly when this happened, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Wow. I have to ask you, Isaiah, what was your reaction to seeing our Lord? Well, I'll tell you my reaction in a minute, but you have to understand where I was at this point. This was the year that King Uzziah died. He was one of my last hopes. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get him to do what God had done, and he was trying to live his life, but he was not following through. And then I saw what was going to happen when he died. He was very sick, Mm -hmm. probably leprosy. That's what we would have called it today. I, I was seeing his decline, the decline of the people. And here I am in this position of influence in the highest government in the land, and everything's falling apart before me. And I saw the kings that were going to follow, and it was going to be a disaster. When you're in leadership, and we rise to these positions of of influence, this this is really the power brokers of the country, right? You feel like you're in control. You feel like you can get things done. And everything was spinning out of control. I had no one else to even talk to. Not like you right now. I was, I was alone. 
I was in complete discouragement. We weren't hearing directly from God. I knew what we were supposed to be doing, but I was sort of watching this all cycle downward, and I was crying out, God, where are you? And then he gave me this vision. So let me just tell you what's going on here. I mean, this is a vision. I don't believe that God sits on a throne all the time, but this had symbolic meaning to me because what I saw was a throne that was completely abdicated. There was nobody sitting on the throne who was worthy to lead this people. And God showed me this vision, and he said, I'm on the throne. I'm in control. And then it says, you know, his screen of his robe fills the temple. Um, you've probably been to some modern weddings. You've seen the brides with their big trains, okay? It's sort of to honor, it's just to show the honor of the bride, right? The longer the train, you know, the more honor, I guess you could say. The fact that the train of his robe filled the temple is symbolic meaning of how worthy he was. Then we see the two seraphim. They sound kind of odd, right? But mm -hmm. let me tell you what the symbolic meaning is. So they have six wings. So two are covering their face. They are in such humility before God that they can't even look on his face. They're, they recognize that they're created beings. Our most humble parts of our bodies, if you want to use an example of us, our most humble body part is our feet, touches the ground and the dirt. So here even the seraphim, they're covering their feet, recognizing their createdness before their creator. And then finally, they've got two wings that they're flying all around. They're in continual service before the Lord. And what I realized here is they're calling to each other. They're calling to each other saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then, I, I couldn't describe it. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. I'm just trying to use my best words here. I, I know you got this theater down the road here. You know, they've got the giant screen. They've got the seats that like shake and shudder, you know, to what's going on in the screen. They've got the Dolby sound. Okay? That's nothing. That cannot compare to what I saw here. So you're asking me, how did I feel in this moment? I'll just read you my words. I said, woe is me. For I'm lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you are in the presence of of the Almighty God in all of His holiness. The only thing that I, I became instantly aware of is how sinful I was. I had no right to be there. I knew how the priests approached the Lord. If they did not go into the Holy of Holies after following precise instructions, covering themselves with the blood of the sacrifice, they would be killed. So I'm in the presence of, of God. I'm recognizing my, my sinfulness. I'm a dead man. So then the, one of the seraphim flew over to me. This is what he did. He had, in his hand, he had taken a coal from an altar that was before the Lord. That altar was a picture of sacrifice. Now, I know now this was forecasting the eternal sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he took the coal and he touched my lips. And then he said this amazing thing. He said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. So here I was, once I recognized who God was, how far I was from him, once I recognized my sinfulness, I also knew I had no mediator. I had no way, no right to be in his presence. And through sacrifice, an eternal sacrifice, I was atoned and allowed to be in his presence. This is the picture of the gospel that we wrote about and we forecast, which I'm going to tell you about today. This is how we come to Christ. We first recognize that he's the almighty God, that he's the creator in all of his holiness. And once we recognize how holy he is, then we become immediately aware of how sinful we are. 
And we recognize that we don't have a mediator. We have no way to cross the chasm unless there's a sacrifice. And that mediator reaches out to us and he gives us the salvation and then we can come into his presence. So after that point, I want you to notice something here. I have not heard from God yet. In my sinfulness, in the recognition of my sinfulness, until I had had the mediator, I did not know what my calling was. But then it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? So I said, here I am. Mm -hmm. Send me. That was my calling. That was the moment I knew that I was called as a prophet of God. And as all of us have had a, an event where we can identify, where we recognize that God is almighty and holy, that we are separated by a chasm that we cannot possibly cross, and yet God reaches out in salvation and he brings us to him as our mediator. That's the gospel message. And it was depicted right here. Isaiah, what is the central theme from your ministry that you are going to be sharing with us here today? I just told you. I, I know you don't think a lot of the prophets of the Bible have good news, but that's exactly what my book's all about, at least what God's message is through me. It's about good news. It's about the gospel. And I'm going to tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Out of character now. I, I, I can dress down a bit. I'm okay. You guys don't have any trouble finding Isaiah in the Bible, right? Like if you flip anywhere, you end up in Hosea. It's 66 books. Obviously, God had a lot to say through me. It's pretty amazing. I, it takes an hour and a half to read Isaiah start to finish because I've done it several times. You get faster as, as you get a little more familiar with it. It's an amazing book. I struggled initially to really know where to even go with this. There's so much covered in the book of Isaiah. But once you read it from beginning to end, it sort of just jumps out at you, okay? Now, the clue should have come from his name. I did not know this until I studied this um, over these past few weeks. Isaiah is basically derived from a mashup of two Hebrew words, yasha and yah, okay? Yasha meaning to save, and yah, the name of the Lord, okay? So my name means the Lord is salvation. Well, where have we heard this before? Let's look at these related names. Elisha, Hosanna, Hosea, Yeshua, Joshua, and yes, Jesus. So is it any surprise that God called me to present the most complete picture of the servant Messiah who was to come and be the mediator for the whole world. And so I think that's cool that even in my name reflects the message and the gospel message of this book. So what are we going to learn today? We're going to learn who God is and who his character is. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. He was revealed in his servant, the Messiah. God is sovereign over all things. He's a God of action. He's a God of faithfulness. He's a God of encouragement. He's a God of compassion. And once we understand who God is, the next part of the book is, how shall we now live? And that's our message for today. If we understand the God of Isaiah, the God that is presented in, in this book, then this should instill in us a desire to live according to the calling. So the central theme is good news, the gospel. Now, one thing that I, I think after going through that vision that I presented you of, of Isaiah's calling, what jumped out at to me is we too often cheapen the gospel message. There are some who think of the gospel message like a game of Monopoly. So remember on Monopoly, you roll, and you go around go, and you get your 200 bucks. You're like, woo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, right? And then you land on community chest, and you pick up community chest, and it says, bank error in your favor. Woo-hoo-hoo, $200, okay? Good news. No. That is not the gospel message, okay? The gospel message isn't you living your life, making the world a better place, living in comfort, and then, you know what? I got this thing at the end of my life, and I need to make sure that I got that covered too. 
oh, uh, this Jesus thing, yeah. Let, let, me, let me cover that too. I'm going to make sure that I got that in my back pocket too. That's not the gospel message, okay? The gospel message is what I showed you in the vision of Isaiah before the Lord. We've all got to come to the place where we recognize that he's the creator of the universe, that he's sovereign over all things, that he is holy and righteous. And then, once we understand who he is, we need to understand who we are. We are sinful. Remember what Isaiah said? I am a, I'm a man of sin, and I come from a, a sinful people. And I have no mediator. Is there anything I can do to cross that chasm? Absolutely nothing. It's only through God's grace he's the mediation and he atones for my sin. That's the gospel message. That's the gospel message of Isaiah. Let me read you the good news of Isaiah. This is from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John, this is you. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah is a God-centered vision of all things. It's centered on God's promises of protection, deliverance, purging of sin, restoration. Restoration of who? A guilty and defiled covenant people. The people that God had made his loving covenant with and they walked away. It's centered on the landscape of salvation history, not just the salvation of the Jewish people. This is a salvation that's eternal and global in scope. It's centered on God's purpose and plan, so his eternal decree, if you like, and it will not be thwarted by strong and aggressive nations. I showed you what Israel was surrounded by. God's eternal decree is not going to be thwarted by that. And secondly, it's certainly not going to be derailed by an unfaithful people like we were in Judah and Israel. Isaiah 46, 8 and 10 says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. If you read what's going on, the Assyrian king Sennacherib, is knocking on the doorstep of Jerusalem. And he's taunting this God right here. He's making fun and belittling the God of the universe. That's not going to go unchecked. The Lord is the sovereign God. We see that in uh, Isaiah 43, 13. We see that he is mentioned as the Holy One. First in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. And then, 24 other times, he's mentioned as the Holy One. That has to have significance. Isaiah 43, 14. God is clearly identified as our Redeemer. He says, even from eternity, I am He. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake... I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. I'm showing my power over all things. Isaiah didn't even see the Babylonian kingdom. He was just given a vision of what they were going to be. The greatest human empire that was ever on the earth. Such a great empire that it's depicted as the empire of all empires in, in Revelation. And then finally identified as the savior of the world. In verse 11 in chapter 43 says, I, even I am the Lord, there is no savior besides me. We don't get a better picture in the Old Testament of Jesus the Messiah except from Isaiah. 
Isaiah portrays how the Messiah will bring in ultimate victory through both suffering, death, and ultimate vindication. His sufferings reveal powerfully in chapter 53. This is a familiar passage. We won't have time to go through that all today. His glorious coming is shown in chapters 34 and 35. But in chapter 11, we see a beautiful picture of the coming king and the kingdom. This is why Isaiah is such good news. Let me read you from chapter 11. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. I'm identifying that the Messiah is the king. He's from the root of Jesse, from the Davidic line. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is his anointing. He is anointed, just like they anointed the kings, he's anointed with the spirit of the Lord. He's going to have a righteous reign, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he's his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Here's his glorious kingdom. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. And the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then you see this beautiful picture of his gathering together of his people from the four corners of the earth. This isn't a call to salvation for just the people of Judah. This is the call of salvation for the whole world. And then it will come about in that day that the nations will, res- the nations will resort to the root of Jesse who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. And then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shilar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth then the jealousy of Ephraim will, d- will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. They will plunder the sons of the east, and they will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and he will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind. He will strike it into seven streams and make men walk over dry shod. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. The picture here is God has purged everything that is evil out of the way. And it's now like an open highway. The the nations of the world are streaming to God in Zion. This is the picture of salvation. It's a great passage here from chapter 9. I know you're familiar with this the sign of the Messiah. The lead up to this is the absolute gloom of the people before the appearance of this child. But then in verse 6 it says, for a child will be born and to us a son will be given to us. To us. This is a, a gift of divine grace to sinners. That's why it's so great that we exchange gifts at Christmas. In some small way, we're just celebrating the gift of God's Son to us. To us. A child, a son. 